let's let's get started. Um, I I think I'm, I'm a bit optimistic in terms of how much I can cover. So I'll, I'll speak a bit quickly. Hopefully everybody can follow along and I'll be here for some questions just in case I ran through something uh, quickly. I've been thinking about this topic for some time about how can we as developers think about cloud computing. You know, when we look at the cloud uh, these days, there are a number of terms that are being thrown around, whether it is software defined networking, cloud transformation, digital transformation. We see all these terms being thrown around. But what does all that mean to me as a developer? And that's a question that I've often asked myself. What can I do at, at absolutely the code level that can further my organizations or my customers' cloud objectives? So that's a one-line motivation for this talk. The agenda, I've sort of broken it up into four parts. We were talking about this earlier. One is defensive programming. And you know these are good programming practices. And if you've been programming in the cloud for some time, I think you would have, you'd probably see that. I want to show you a couple of examples to take away from the things that I've seen. We'll talk about that. I think of when you approach Azure, it can be overwhelming with a number of services. So we as developers need to understand the Lego blocks that are Azure and then be able to guide our designs based on that. And then cost is becoming a factor in the cloud now as we scale up our applications. How can we be more aware of the cost? And it shouldn't be that some administrator comes and says, these are the top 10 most expensive things. It should come ground up when we are designing these systems. And then finally, infrastructure is code. At this point in 2020, most people know that you, know, you should be automating the provisioning of infrastructure. I want to call out some of the recent examples, maybe things that have been previewed in the last three to six months that tell you that a developer mindset is needed to go towards this infrastructure as a code idea. So that's... That's the agenda. Uh, let's let us get started here. So let's learn about the defensive programming techniques. So first and foremost, I want to talk about the retry logic, which many of you may be familiar with. Let's let's look at why this is important. Of course, transient faults or faults that can go away in a period of time can happen anywhere. That can happen in an on-premises environment, can happen in a private cloud, and can happen in public cloud as well. I would argue that the chances of a transient fault are higher in the cloud. And the reason for that is that unlike in an on-premises world where you had dedicated capacity and often underutilized dedicated capacity, in the cloud you're in a multi-tenant environment, so you can be throttled and things like that. So as a result, and you know, there are, you're dependent on multiple services, as we will see, storage, app service, what have you. Because of the dependent on the services, you have a chance that a transient failure may occur. So if that is the case, it would greatly benefit us if we try to write logic which is resilient to transient failures. Fortunately, in 2020, and, and you know, I gave this talk maybe four or five years back. Uh, if you were using the various Azure SDKs, uh, the retrial logic was not often built in and you had to rely on other libraries. Fortunately, now, uh, if you look at the cross, uh, the spectrum of SDK services, the retrial logic is baked in. In fact, let's take a quick example here. So I'm going to go into Visual Studio Code. I just pasted some snippets here that I want to call out. Just a second, getting some noise from. Yeah, sorry about that. So let me call out an example here. So let's look at uh, line four, and this is from the Cosmos DB SDK. If you look at line five, all we are saying is we want to establish a connection to the Cosmos DB service, but we are explicitly setting up a policy where we are saying, hey, I want you to have a maximum retry attempts of three, and then you, this is the maximum retry wait time in seconds, et cetera. So you're able to do that, not have to write too much code, just set up a policy. If you look at the next code snippet, line 10 and below, and in fact, pay attention to line 15 here, and this is coming from the storage SDK. This goes even further here. If you look at line 15, not only am I able to set up a retrial logic, I'm able to say that try once, the interval between the first and the second attempt should be backing off exponentially. And that's a good idea because you don't want to inundate the resources that you're calling. So 
just by using some simple programming practices, you can greatly uh, avoid a transient failure. So that's that's one thing to, to note here. Let's just go back to the slide for a second. Of course, retry logic that you have is increasingly or is very important for you to test and not many people get an opportunity to test your retry logic. Why? Because it's really hard to simulate transient failures. So now you have these three or four lines of code of retry logic, which is really important, but you have not tested it. And it only gets tested at 2 a.m. when something happens. Wouldn't it be a good idea to be able to test this retry logic? And I want to give you an example uh, of how I tested my retry logic. And I want, this is based on an outage that we suffered. And the reason for that outage was that we had a retry logic, but that retry logic was set to retry for about 30 seconds or so. And this was against the Azure Redis cache. And as you know, Azure Redis cache has a high availability option. So it was a transient failure, but the recovery from that transient failure took more than 30 seconds, which was the maximum retry timeout that I had set. As a result, we deemed it to be not a transient failure. So let me give you an example of how you can, one approach of how you can test your retrial logic. And here, what I have uh, is, uh, you can see in this window, this is a VM in Azure. Fortunately, in case of Redis, uh, there is a C++ version available for Windows. I took that C++ version, I injected some chaos in that version, recompiled it, and that's the version I'm running. So now I have a version of a service which can throw some transient failures randomly. And then I went wrote a client program uh, which is going to make 1,000 attempts to go and make call into the Redis cache server, the one that we just injected some fault in. And if you run this program here, it will run 1,000 instances of this, test out our retry logic, and we can come back to that in a few minutes to see how we did. That gives us a good way of, of looking at our retry logic and saying, does this make sense or not? Okay, let's move on. Back to the slide. So we talked about the retry logic. In some cases, you will find that uh, it is not a transient failure. Okay, so in that case, you really can't be, your retry logic is not going to help you. In that case, there's another pattern that you may be familiar with called break the circuit. And what is really interesting about this pattern, in fact, let me show you a, a, an article here. And by the way, I'm going to take all of these URLs that I show you, I will make them available so you don't have to worry about grabbing these URLs. Here's a very interesting article that talks about common causes of cloud outages. And if you come in and search for um, exhaustion, you will find that a majority of these root cause for these outages is resource exhaustion. Why am I talking about this in the case of break the circuit? The reason I'm calling is if this is not a transient failure and if you continue to make a call to that service which is not responding to you, all you're doing is consuming more resources. Maybe you're filling up a queue of some sort. And if you're filling up this queue, you will ultimately end up in a situation where you have resource exhaustion. And as I showed you in the previous web page, a majority of cloud outages are related to resource exhaustion. Let's take a quick look at a code to help us understand. Once again, I want to show you an example of a circuit breaker here. So this is a piece of code that is available on Microsoft Docs. I just grabbed that code, but very interesting code to walk through here. So I've implemented circuit breaker here, and all this is doing is sitting between the caller and the service. We check if the circuit is open. If the circuit is open, we will talk about this in a moment. Circuit is open, meaning the underlying service is not callable. If the circuit is closed, no problem. Go ahead and call that action. If the circuit is indeed open, then let's see what we have to do. If the circuit is open, what we do here, again, looking at the code, we wait for a period of time. We don't want to inundate the underlying service, so we wait for a period of time. If that timeout has expired, Okay, so we have not gone back and checked the underlying service in a, in five minutes, that's good. Let's do that. But look at this interesting code in line 19 and below. We do that very carefully. We take a lock, so we are not sending every single thread into that service. We take a lock, 
we check if the if the underlying service is back up again if the underlying service is is indeed back up again then we will again uh, close the circuit so subsequent calls can go in so some pattern like this again will greatly help with uh, dealing with these kinds of resource exhaustion kinds of outages let's go back and to our slides the next pattern i want to talk about is a very interesting problem once again this outage happened and this is a very cloud only kind of an outage what watch for uninitialized state now you would say which was uninitialized state can happen anywhere but let me show you an example of what happened with a cloud service instance uh, that i used so right here let me show you a service definition and don't worry if you are not familiar with cloud services uh, that's one other service in azure and uh, what is important to walk away from this code snippet is initialization is key let me point out to an example look at line 11 here and in line 11 uh, when my cloud service starts i i get some local storage uh, from the cloud service provider and in this case because i'm doing a pretty expensive piece of initialization what i said here was i said clean up on role recycle set to false which means hey if you're going to reboot my machine to apply some kind of a patch don't recycle my local storage because i have an expensive piece of initialization done okay makes sense many people do that so i had set this to false now look at the code right here inside the worker role uh, i will remember the line number to speed up so go to 98 yeah inside the worker role on start method i come in my system has patched i come back in on role on start gets called i go and check the initialize function let's go to the initialize function here here i come in and say okay is the initialization done if it is done what i do is write write a breadcrumb on the data drive okay that's what it's done so everything looks good here now here's why an outage happened in the project that i was working on the d drive was fine but there was a hard disk failure azure detected that hard disk failure restarted my cloud service instance so i got a brand new c drive and now my breadcrumbs was intact and i assumed that my initialization was done and i continued on and caused an outage well what i should have done looking back at this i should have not only looked for breadcrumbs i should have tested if the registry setting was there or not in this case of initialization okay so very unique to cloud you don't have machines disappear and a brand new c drive appear on you uh, if you are not in the cloud so you have to be careful about these kinds of things okay let's go back to the slides the last thing i want to talk about and how are we doing in terms of time good so last thing i want to do in terms of uh, this defensive programming is something called resilience plan for resilience and i want to introduce you to a very interesting uh, approach that microsoft uses internally uh, for many of their services and there's a link down there it's a bit cut off but once again i'll make this available to you so microsoft uses something called the resilience modeling and analysis when they're doing resilience analysis of their services internally and what this method is really very simple method you think about availability from early in your design so when you are putting together this candidate architecture you think about uh, resilience you think about uh, how are you going to be able to detect the failures and how are you going to uh, sort of uh, provide a tangible output so actually let me give an example of that will make much much clearer here so what did resilience modeling analysis method is something like this let me zoom in into this a little bit you can see it better yep so as you can see in this diagram all i have done is created a component interaction diagram so here are the various pieces of my candidate architecture i have drawn lines between them you go over this diagram and see what are the failure points here oh what if my storage location is unavailable would i be able to go to the secondary location uh what, what if my sql azure sql database is unavailable what kind of geo replication strategy do i have so i have to take at each of the dotted lines and think about what failures can happen i document those failure points now 
you cannot uh, resolve every single failure point because that's more of a business decision than a technical glitch because you know they're only willing to pay only so much to make this application perfect but at the very least you know all the failure points you know you can detect that failure point and you at least have a mitigation strategy so very important technique i can tell you sitting into many outage calls for mission critical applications with our customers if you have done this kind of analysis it makes your life much much simpler okay so that's that concludes our first section and i think we're doing fine in terms of time i want to now quickly move over to the next section which is learn about azure building blocks so we're changing gears here a little bit from programming patterns to building blocks what do i mean by that here so once again once you're getting started with azure it is really important for you to have a general intuition for what are the different services and why would i be using this service over another okay because if you don't make that decision well then you might have chosen an option that may not work well you for you in the wrong term let me show you a slide here and see if uh, you, you guys can see this hopefully um and let me uh, yeah so you can see the slide once again uh, I, I would like to do a shout out for the azure docs team here most of my examples have come from the documentation so i can't recommend enough you know the concept especially if you go to a service and you find the concept section of a service there's some really useful articles that i highly recommend you read uh, i know as a developer you tend to go to documentation only when you need to go to but uh, you can go find in the concept section some really important uh, pieces of advice and one such advice is shown here on the screen for you guys so if you look at this this diagram right here and let me just get myself a pen here so i can explain this better okay so if you look at this diagram right here uh, we have uh, azure vms we have azure container instances we have azure app service with and without containers okay, both options are supported we have aks and we have azure functions and not to forget azure batch these are the spectrum of compute options you have available now let's look at the services that you can say if you're building a, a web application uh, you know a single web application a monolithic web application then you can build it on any of these compute options but the the tick mark in blue says the recommended option so if you have a web app that you're trying to host you want to scale up and down you want a number of out of box capabilities app service is a great choice of course you can do that in aks but app service is a great choice if you have an end tier application not a microservices style application but an end tier application where you have coarse grain services then you can once again you can do it anywhere you want but app service is a great option with all of the capabilities that are baked in if you are however building a, a microservices based application where you have dozens and dozens of microservices you want a cloud native approach you are thinking of a cloud agnostic approach uh, aks is a good option and the document needs to be updated here of course uh, we know that the windows support for aks is in preview right now and if you have not played with it it is pretty cool i encourage you to try it out if you are building an event driven application azure functions is probably the most recommended approach now don't forget the batch here if you are building batch applications then uh, whether are you running a background job that needs to run at a certain point in time well azure function may be fine that's a great trigger of trigger for that if you are however running a batch job that requires a bigger scale uh, it requires a long running operation then maybe azure batch is the option so thinking about these things i have hopefully given you a little bit of advice you want you want to go ahead and read about these services so as you approach these projects knowing this will be very helpful now let me move on to the next slide here not only should you be aware of these building blocks that we looked in the previous slide you should also be aware of their resilience characteristics because that is important as well so i was talking about the resilience modeling and analysis in the previous uh, section let's take that into action here so azure sql database for example azure sql database gives you a notion of active replication 
Uh, it is all asynchronous replication. It can give you up to four readable secondaries. Okay, so you are able to do a planned failover, or you can do an unplanned failover if if the primary goes down for some reason. So you have these options. Think through these options. Figure out the window of data loss. Figure out what is the time for you to fail over and things like that. That's important to note. I want to give you one other example related to Cosmos DB here. Uh, actually, I mean, I missed one important bullet. Azure SQL database geo replication, of course, gives you a user controlled failover, but it also offers you a fail back capability as well. All right, let me talk about Azure Cosmos DB here. And Cosmos DB gives you a couple of interesting options here that are worth talking about. You can look at the diagram on the right here. This is the screenshot from when you're setting up the account. And it's hard to read, but I'll, I'll tell you, you can do geo redundancy, you can do multi-region writes, and, and you can do availability zones. How does that relate to us, our discussion here? Of course, you can do geo replication. That's baked into the service. You can do automatic regional failures. What is very interesting, of course, in case of Cosmos DB is they have this discovery protocol that is constantly running. If one region goes down, you don't need to change the connection string, as is the case in the previous slide. So here, you don't have to change the connection string. multi master this is something that is a holy grail of high availability applications in the cloud. If you can have an application that can have multiple rights in two different regions, you can get out of the business of failovers and, and fail back and all of that. So Azure Cosmos DB provides you a multi-master capability where you can be writing in two regions and then there are conflict resolution approaches that come into play to deal with these kinds of situations. So a great option. Once again, knowing these characteristics will go a long way in helping you build resilient applications. I want to call out one other capability related to this building block that's important for you to know before we move on to the next segment. So you're probably using Azure SQL database or using storage or using Azure Functions. What is interesting about these services is, of course, they provide rich capabilities, easy to get started. They give you a shared infrastructure, or you can go to a dedicated infrastructure. But all of these services have been available over an internet endpoint. Of course, you can secure the internet endpoint. In case of storage, uh, for years now, we've been able to apply a firewall rule on top of that, right? So you go to a customer or an organization that wants to use these services like the ones we talked about, Cosmos DB, functions, what have you, but they don't want to expose their endpoints to the internet. They only want to be able to talk to these services over a private connection. Well, the, the, the new capabilities that, that we talked about at Ignite, uh, uh, the private link capability, and let me show you a diagram here. So this diagram sort of will help you understand what's going on. So on the right hand side of this diagram, you can see here, right here, you can see we have Azure Pass services like SQL, Cosmos, Storage, and in the past you had to have an internet account or internet access, right? And I should say in the past, for for the last eighteen months or so, we have had this capability of service endpoints. But now we have a capability of private links, which goes even further, and I'll explain why. With, with the private link capability, you can essentially uh, not have any internet access. The only access is from your own virtual network. Okay? And this is really important to understand because now you can go to a financial institution or you can go to an agency that requires that packets do not travel over the internet, you can come up with an architecture that combines these things. And why does it relate to programming? Because as developers, we are often being asked to suggest these building blocks. And I'm not suggesting that we all become network administrators and know all the routing rules, but it is important to, at a high level, understand how these services are available so that we can meet the security mandates that uh, may be required for an application here. Uh, one last thing to point out here, which is really the cool part about private link, and we did not have this ability in the service endpoints that were available earlier, that 
Here, not only can you talk to storage from, let's say, your AKS cluster, right? Your AKS cluster wants to talk to storage. Not only can you do that, you can also say that you only want to talk to storage accounts, ABC and XYZ and no other storage account. And security uh, folks call this capability data exfiltration that you can only write to storage accounts that have been uh, provisioned and this capability gives you that access. So in my mind, we really at a, at a point where it's best of both worlds. We can take advantage of something like Azure Functions and you need premium for this, but something like Azure Functions that scales up and down on its own, but at the same time, all of the packets are flowing over an internal network, okay? So that concludes section number two uh, of, of our presentation. So remember, just a reminder to everybody, we talked about some patterns, retrial logic, uh, and then we talked about the importance of knowing the key characteristics of these Lego blocks so we know to assemble the right Lego blocks. Okay, so let's move on to our third section, which is about cost-aware programming. And as I said earlier, cost is becoming a big factor uh, it was great to, it was easy enough to get started, but as these applications are running, people are finding that they need to manage these costs. And of course, there are tools like the cost management service in Azure, which tells you that you may be spending too much here, or uh, you, know, you can save by doing this. Uh, they, of course, are once again coming from a top-down approach. But once again, as developers, we can make some design decisions which can have big implications on cost. Let's take a look at the example here. So uh, here we have uh, an application that is comprised of four things, right? Our application has web servers, right? And this is no different from a portfolio of application that you may have within your organization. So I have a web server, I have a bunch of services. So web server, typical spikes, uh, that happen. Then you have a bunch of services which have more predictable spikes. Then I have some batch workloads, and then I have some uh, line of business applications, right? A very typical portfolio that your organization may have. Now, uh, I can take all these four application types, and I can run them on 100 DS D8 SV3 four core machines. I can do that, and I can meet all of these requirements. If I did that, I would end up paying $658,000 a year, okay? What can we do better? And there are some programming things involved here for us to get a lower cost. Let's take a look. So here are some optimizations that we can do and we will, what we will do is I'll list these options right now and then I will talk about each one of them in a moment here. So first and foremost, burstable VMs. If you're not familiar with that, I have a slide on that. We could do burstable VMs that's a great option for web servers. I can do auto scaling using VM scale sets. For batch workloads, I can use something like Azure Batch that we talked about earlier. And for my line of business applications, maybe I want to containerize them, okay? So what are burstable VMs? Let's take a look at that. So what is a burstable VM? Uh, as you can see here, very interesting concept. You essentially provision a VM that matches the baseline performance, not your top line performance, but your baseline performance. So how does this work? The idea is that you have a web server that needs to spike up occasionally, but most of the time it is running well, it is being underutilized. So why should you be provisioning a capacity that is highest? Provision a baseline capacity. So when you are running this web server, at lower than baseline, Microsoft will notice that and they will give you credits back. So think of the cell phone plan where you can take the unused minutes and apply it to the next month, exactly the same concept here. So if you're running below the baseline, they will accrue these credits for you. So when that surge does happen, when you have many visitors to your website, you can use those credits and pay for it. Okay, that's the concept of a burstable VM. If you did that, you can get about 10% savings right here, okay? So 10% savings just by using a burstable VM. Let's look at the other uh, aspect of our application portfolio, where we have an application that has a predictable scaling, 
And if it is a predictable scaling model, then we can use something like VM scale set. We don't need to spin up those machines ahead of time. And the beauty of VM scale set is that provisioning new instances is really quick and predictable. Uh, so you can do that. And if you did that, you can save an additional 25% okay, from your cost. So as you can see, we are, we are taking this number down. Let's talk about your batch workloads. What happens to your batch workloads? And this is where I want to call out an important programming change that you can make that can save your organization a lot of money. I had this conversation with someone just recently. So you can take your batch loads and run it in low priority VMs. What are low priority VMs? Low priority VMs are VMs where Microsoft can come and yank those VMs with a notice of 30 seconds. And in fact, uh, low priority is being replaced right now in preview, is being replaced by something called spot instances where you'll be able to name a price and they are essentially selling their excess capacity. But you know, check out spot instances, it's in preview. But let's talk about low priority. So low priority VMs, you can get a 60 to 80% discount. And this is, the, this is the cost modeling I did with a customer recently. You can get that 60 to 8 percent discount for your batch workloads, but uh, oh, so you are telling me that you'll yank the VMs on a 30 second notice. How will that work? Well, if we wrote our batch programs with a checkpoint restart pattern, where every time we start a batch aspect of a batch, we wrote a checkpoint, and if something were to go wrong and we go back to that checkpoint, a simple pattern like that. Uh, can allow us to take advantage of an option which is 60 to 80 percent cheaper. Okay, so if you if you did that math, you can get 60 percent more savings here as well. The the final thing I want to talk about: you have many line of business applications, and I absolutely am talking about Windows containers here as well. You have many lines of business applications. It makes no sense to just get a VM, and you know you don't have this ability with line of business applications because you know even if you have low usage, you can't turn them off. You have to keep them running. So if you have a line of business application, uh, you don't want to run them on a VM and then pay for that VM and see that your CPU utilization is only eight or 10%. That makes no sense. Wouldn't it be better to take that Windows application or, or, or some other application, containerize it, so now you can as you can see in the picture on the right hand side, one host OS, multiple containers. So you can greatly reduce the cost. As you can see here, you can get 65% more savings here. So hopefully that gives everybody uh, you know, a notion of what we can do as developers to uh, help with the overall cost optimization. And I, I should mention one other thing in the auto scaling option here. In the auto scaling option right here, there are some auto scaling parameters that are built in based on which you auto scale. And here's an opportunity once again for developers like us to further optimize because sometimes just using a CPU threshold for auto scaling may not be the most optimal thing to do. Maybe there is some sort of an application characteristic which is a better representative of when you want to do the scaling, right? So exposing a custom performance counter maybe, exposing some other logic that allows you to scale would be a much better option. So hopefully that gives you some, some ideas to think about here. And let me just go back here uh, to our slides. I want to go back and talk about our last segment. I think we are doing well in terms of time. So let's talk about infrastructure as code here. So many of you are looking at this and saying, yes, Vishwas, of course, uh, we should be thinking about infrastructure as code. So what's new here? Well, why are you bringing this up here? So let me let me give you some thoughts here. Well, so first and foremost, uh, there was a talk recently. I can't figure out um, which event it was. I'll have to go back and think some more. Uh, there was a bunch of CIOs who had adopted the cloud uh, for the last three or four years. And there was a question in that round table uh, where they went around and said, now that you've been in the cloud for three or four years, what is one thing that you will tell the audience that would help them in their journey to the cloud? And the answer across these four CIOs who are 
big users of the cloud answers across the board and and by the way the audience was mixed they were not just azure uh, users they were azure and other users the consistent theme across that round table was automation was key to our success and if i had to do this over again i would invest more in automation more robust automation so that was a very telling thing for me for from people who have been in the cloud so automation is key to success no question about this and we as developers need to understand this infrastructure as code much better whether you are building arm templates which is the dominant way of provisioning infrastructure in azure whether your preferred model is powershell or you might want to do infrastructure as a code in a tool which is multi cloud like terraform or you're a javascript developer and you like the javascript construct to provision resources pick your tool but it is really important for us as developers to think about infrastructure as code uh, and keep in mind that infrastructure as a code has moved well beyond provisioning vm and network and storage it has moved well beyond that and in fact many people if you look at what is happening in the kubernetes community the latest thinking there is don't just treat your application pods as something you can restart any point in time and throw away and restart also think of your clusters as something like cattle and not pets that's the thinking and you know in order to achieve this there are a lot of programming constructs that come into play here so what i want to do here for you to to motivate this aspect of why infrastructure as cloud is important i want to take about three announcements in the last 6 months or so and i want to talk about those announcements and my goal here is that as i talk about those announcements i want to motivate that a developer mindset a developer thinking is increasingly required uh, the same things that we apply the retry logic the code scans the static analysis all of those things are going into infrastructure as code as well so let me show you three examples uh, you may have seen them you may not have seen them because they just came out in the last 6 months so number one is azure resource manager template toolkit this is still in preview so what does this do well microsoft realized that people are writing tons and tons of template code and wouldn't it be nice if we were able to run a static analysis on this code that helps us write better infrastructure as code so let me show you a demo of this very quickly if i can okay it looks like i i shut my um uh, this environment so i might uh it might take me a second or two to set it up I, sorry i i it takes me because i have to run a bunch of environment variables i don't know why i shut this down in any case i want to show you the code here uh let's let's go here i want to i fortunately i have that code here that i can show you so let's let's um close some of these things and let me just try to find right here and so right here is the arm ttk or a toolkit and what this allows you to do is you can take an any any arm template that you are about to run you can come in and run this um, toolkit and it does static analysis on your code so it tells you uh, you know are you using hard coded strings uh, in this case you are using a parameter that may not work well so things like that once again things that we are very used to so imagine taking your infrastructure's code scripts uh, doing a pre build check doing a static scan and then only allowing check in based on that so that's one thing i wanted to talk about really quickly sorry i can't show you to them it took me some time to set it up but uh, uh, if you have some time left or during the q and a i will try to run it for you okay so let's let's go on to to uh, one other concept that i want to talk about which is the custom resource providers and this is also a new concept and why would this come into play and and why would you want to use it 
So if you are familiar with uh, the resource providers, there are about 200 or so resource provider in Azure today. Every service that we talked about, storage, uh, AKS, uh, functions, all of those services have a resource provider underneath the cover. So when you run a ARM template, the ARM template is going through all the resources and then calling the right resource provider. Okay. Wouldn't it be nice if we could write our own resource provider and then add it to the mix? I've been wanting to write my own resource provider for a long time. And finally, this capability is available. I, I believe it's in preview, but let me motivate this by giving you an example. Why would you want to do this? Why, why is this important? And as developers, we are always interested in the extensibility options. Why is this uh, really useful? So imagine that you are trying to automate uh, an provisioning of an application, which is a hybrid application. So 90% of the application resides in Azure, 10% of the application is on-prem, and maybe you have some express route connectivity and things like that, right? So uh, you have this hybrid application. So today, when you're trying to provision such an application, how, how do you go about doing that? Well, you run an ARM template, you provision, okay? You run an ARM, thank you. I was just given five minutes, that's perfect. I'm, I'm just on the last two slides here. So uh, if you run an ARM template, uh, that will provision your Azure infrastructure. And then now I have to go in and log into my on-premises infrastructure, and I have to now do all the things manually there. Wouldn't it be nice if I abstracted my on-prem things, whatever, I'm trying to set a firewall rule, or I'm trying to provision a database, or I'm trying to do something. Wouldn't it be nice if I encapsulated that operation as part of my ARM template? And that's what the resource custom resource provider allows us to do. Let me just show you a, really a quick example of this. Go back to uh, the portal here. And I've written a custom resource provider here that you can find once again in the documentation. And in fact, let's go and um, show hidden types. I'm in a resource group. Let's do a show hidden types. And you can see here that this is this right here is my custom resource provider. And if I wanted to call this, let's go here in Postman for a second. And you can see here, I can simply call this resource provider here. Once again, you can see it is the same, the subscription ID, the resource group, the, the my, my resource group and my custom provider right here. So imagine the possibilities here. I can provision all the Azure resources and then I can come in and, and provision some on-premises resources here as well. Once again, things for us developers to think about. The last slide that I want to talk about here is uh, the infrastructure as code is evolving rapidly, and I want to give you a, something to think about. I promise you this is the last slide and we'll go to Q&A. So as we are looking at things like Kubernetes, which in my mind is becoming uh, an infrastructure API by itself, why do I think that? If you, if you look at um, this options right here, let me just get myself my pen here once again. And if you look at, uh, if you're not familiar with Kubernetes, this example may not make sense, but uh, the thing to take away here is when you're building applications for Kubernetes, you're just telling Kubernetes that here are my containers, and oh, by the way, I will need an Azure disk right here. So notice here, you're not calling an ARM template, you're not calling a REST API, all you're doing is you're telling Kubernetes, hey, by the way, I will need an Azure disk. And Kubernetes abstracts everything that needs to happen. Let me give you another example. I want to deploy an application, maybe a machine learning training application. I'm telling Kubernetes, hey, by the way, I need an NVIDIA GPU. I'm not going to the portal and provisioning a VM. I'm telling Kubernetes to do that for me. So as you can see here, these things are getting closer and closer to code. So I encourage you to think more about infrastructure as in code. And with that, let me pause here and see if you can go to the Q&A. Okay, so that's that's so that's that's me up for this one. Vishwas, that was an amazing session. Everybody in the chat channel is really enjoying it. Um, the big question they're all asking is, are you able to share your slides anywhere for them after the event? 
Absolutely. I'll do that. As soon as we end here, I'll email it to you. That's awesome. Thank you. All right. So, so I, as I was just saying to my fellow presenters, I've got pages of notes from that one. Um, one interesting thing for me, though, you, you, you talked about some really interesting stuff around, around development, around choosing services, and I've got questions on all of that. You didn't talk about configuration management, and I'm really interested to, to, to hear your thoughts on that, whether you try and move configuration into an external service, like maybe et cetera, D or console, and, and, and how you manage that in your, your applications. Uh, that's that's an inter that's a very good question about uh, the configuration management aspect of it. Of course, in in an environment like like Kubernetes, uh, you know your configuration data is all going into etcd, and uh, and you know, all your listeners may or may not be familiar with this. But if you're going to AKS, uh, uh, Cosmos is providing the underlying protocol. Uh, it, it it actually supports. They announced it at build. Cosmos now supports the underlying protocol that is powering etcd so that's that's one um, thing to think about so uh, to answer your question systems like kubernetes are already moving all of the configuration data into a database if you are not using a service like kubernetes if you are using some other service it is still beneficial to think about configuration as code and uh, maybe having some sort of a config DB that you can drive your changes from. And uh, that's a section in itself. So I'm, I'm struggling to sort of compress an answer for that, but I think that would be an interesting section to talk about the best practices, because what you don't want to end up happen is your configuration is strewn across multiple places and you don't have a unified way of looking at this data. So. Uh, happy to talk more or, or post something via blog and share it with the, the listeners, at least my thoughts. Okay, that, that sounds really interesting. Um, right, okay, so whipping all the way back to the start of the presentation, it was really, it, it was interesting to hear you talking about that sort of defensive program about retry and, and, and um, circuit breaker patterns. Obviously, the code you were showing there was using um, the Azure SDK and some of the built-in capabilities of, of the tooling. What are your thoughts on using sort of common libraries, things like Poly, maybe to help with that? Absolutely, uh, po Poly is, is a is a favorite library of mine. I um, uh, absolutely consider using Poly um, when you're trying to uh, build retry logic. Uh, I wanted to call out. Um, in that part of the presentation that in the past, uh, different SDKs had, some SDKs provided a retry logic, uh, some did not. So we had to incorporate things like poly to make sure we are consistently doing the retry logic. At this point, I would say 90 plus percent of the SDKs have a retry logic baked in, but poly is still relevant because it's not just about calling Azure services, it is also about calling your own services, right? So so that's absolutely uh, something useful and for something that people should be looking at. Okay. And similarly, I mean, that, that was a very, very wide ranging presentation that you, you just gave. And, and one of the things that was, was in my mind is, um, a question really, if, if I want to be a great cloud developer, is it important for me to have a good breadth of knowledge across the technology space? Do I need to understand networking and databases and cloud services as well as being able to write that sort of business logic code that, that you know, my organization needs me to? Yes, that, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. I, I do think that uh, in order to be a good cloud developer, uh, you need to uh, have at least a broad understanding of the building blocks. You you may not know uh, that I need to set up an NSG or should I be setting up an application security group and how what is the best practice of setting an NSG. Maybe somebody else will do that. But you need to at least have an intuition for what service to use and how the traffic patterns will flow and what are the resilience characteristics. And that comes just by, uh, you know, keeping up with, th with the services, but then ultimately it is about the code hygiene and, you know, the good programming practices that apply universally, whether you're a cloud developer or not. I, I know this is a difficult answer because, you know, cloud is changing all the time. Uh, 
and best practices are changing all the time how do you keep up with that and uh, my advice there is that you know have a have a broad understanding of this and then you're able to fortunately we have great documentation we have online courses and what not my own personal approach is that you know try to have a broad understanding and then based on the situation if i need to i'll dive deeper into a certain service so that that actually segues quite nicely onto to the next thing i was going to ask i mean like you i obviously work with with lots of different customers and quite often um I, I'm asked to pause because the audience's heads, heads are melting, because the, the smorgasbord of services in Azure is such a, a broad church, right? How do you pick one over another, particularly when that choice is quite quite nuanced? Um, how would you suggest that, that a, 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 a more novice developer, somebody who's, who's not quite as, as far down that sort of cloud path as, as perhaps you or, or I are, how they can go and, and learn about which are the best choices for given scenarios. Is there, is there a resource you could point them at? There's a resource, absolutely. In fact, the, the, the slide that I showed in my presentation here, and that's why I, I had a shout out for the Azure documentation. Uh, let me find this slide right here. This slide actually comes from an Azure document, which you know, uh, believe it or not, is named when to use what. So this th this is a slide that it comes from that, or this come. I, I I did a screen clip of that page. So you know, I would start there. And as you can see here, you know, it seems overwhelming here. But I, if I'm a cloud developer, I'm getting started. I know that I'm working on a web app, and maybe I'll go learn more about an app service, and then you know, try to understand the nuances of that. Uh, but I'll keep in the back of my mind that there are other services available as well. And uh, so investing some time in trying to keeping up with these services uh, is the new reality, uh, as you know well yourself, that, uh, the, you know, we are spoiled. We see new releases every week or even sooner than that. And the cadence in the cloud is is crazy. And we need to change some of our learning best practices to keep up with the cadence in the cloud.